Thank you uh, so much, uh, everyone from Ted and Chris and Amy in particular. I cannot believe uh, uh, I'm here. I have not slept in weeks. Uh, Neil and I were sitting there comparing how little we've slept uh, in anticipation for this. I've never been so nervous, uh, and I do this when I'm nervous, I just realized. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about sort of what we did at, at this organization called the uh, A26 Valencia, and then I'm going to talk about how we might all join in doing similar things. Back in about 2000, I was, uh, uh, I was living in Brooklyn. Um, I was uh, trying to finish my first book. I was uh, wandering around dazed every day because I wrote from 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. So I would walk around in a daze uh, during the day. I had uh, uh, no mental acuity uh, to speak of during the day. But uh, I had uh, 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 flexible hours. I, I, and in, in the Brooklyn neighborhood that I lived in Park Slope, there were a lot of writers. It's like a very high per capita uh, ratio of writers to uh, normal people. Meanwhile, I had... Uh, Grown up around a lot of uh, teachers. My mom was a teacher, my sister became a teacher. Um, uh, and after college, so many of my friends went into teaching. And so um, I was always hearing them talk about their lives and how inspiring they were. And they were really the sort of the most hardworking and, and constantly inspiring people I knew. But I knew that uh, so many things that they were up against, so many of the, uh, the struggles that they were dealing with. And uh, one of them was that so many of my friends that were teaching in city schools uh, <clears throat> were having trouble with their students that were keeping up uh, at grade level on, in the reading and writing in particular. Now, so many of these students that come from households where English isn't speaking in, spoken in the home, um, where uh, uh, a lot of them have different uh, special needs, uh, learning disabilities, uh, and, there are, and, and of course they're working in schools which sometimes and very often are underfunded. And so they would talk to me about this and say, you know, what we really need is just more people, more bodies, more one-on-one -on -one attention, more sort of hours, more uh, expertise from people that have uh, skills in English and could work with these students one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I would say, well, why don't you just uh, work with them one-on-one? -on -one? And I, they would say, well, we have five classes of 30 to 40 students each. Uh, this can lead up to 150, 180, 200 students a day. How can we possibly give each student even one hour a week of one-on-one -on -one attention? You'd have to greatly uh, multiply the work week and clone the teachers. And so I started we started talking about this, and at the same time, I thought about this massive group of people I knew, writers, editors, journalists, uh, 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 graduate students, uh, assistant professors, you name it, all these people that had sort of flexible daily hours and uh, an interest in the English work. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have an, I, I hope to have an uh, interest in the English language, but I'm not uh, speaking it well right now. <laughs> uh, I'm trying, that clock has got me. All right. so. But everybody that I knew had an interest in the, you know, the primacy of the written word in terms of you know, uh, uh, nurturing a democracy, nurturing an enlightened life. And so, but, uh, and so they had you know, all these uh, sort of uh, their time and their interest, but at the same time, there wasn't a conduit that I knew of in my community to bring these two communities together. So when I moved back to uh, San Francisco, uh, we rented this building. And the idea was to put uh, McSweeney's, uh, McSweeney's Quarterly that we publish twice or three times a year, and a few other magazines. We were going to put that, we were going to move it into an office for the first time. It used to be in my kitchen in Brooklyn. We were going to move it into an office, and we were going to actually share space with a tutoring center. So we thought, we have all these writers and editors and everybody, sort of a writing community, coming into the office every day anyway. Why don't we just open up the front of the building to students to come in there after, after school, get extra help on their written homework. So you have basically no border between these two uh, communities. So, so the idea was that we would be working on whatever we're working on at 2.30, the students flow in, and you put down what you're doing, or you trade, or you work a little bit later, or whatever it is, you, you give those hours in the afternoon to the students in the neighborhood. So, we had this place, we rented it, the landlord was all for it. We did this mural, that's a Chris Ware mural that basically uh, talks about, explains the entire history of the printed word in mural form. It takes a long time to uh, digest and you have to stand in the middle of the road. Uh, so we rented this space and everything was, was great except for the landlord said, well, the space is zoned for retail. You have to come up with something, you've got to sell something. 
Uh, you can't just you know, have a tutoring center. So we thought, ha ha, uh, really? And uh, we couldn't think of anything necessarily to sell, but we, we did all the necessary research. And it used to be a weight room, so there were rubber floors below, acoustic tile uh, ceilings and uh, uh, fluorescent lights. We took all that down, and we found uh, beautiful wooden floors, uh, whitewashed beams, and it had the look. While we were renovating this place, somebody said, you know, it really kind of looks like the hull of a ship, you know? And, um, and we looked around, and somebody else said, well, you should sell uh, supplies to the working buccaneer. And so <laughs> this is uh, what we did. So it made everybody laugh, and then we said, there's a point to that. Let, let's sell uh, pirate supplies. So this is the uh, pirate supply store. So uh, you see, uh, this is sort of a, a sketch I did on a napkin. A great carpenter built all this stuff. And you see uh, that we made it look sort of uh, pirate supply-like. Um, here you see uh, planks sold by the foot. Um, we have uh, supplies to combat scurvy. Uh, we have the uh, peg legs uh, there that are all handmade and fitted to you. Up the top you see the uh, eye patch display, which is the, the uh, black column there for everyday use for your eye patch. And then you have the pastel and other colors for stepping out at night. Um, <laughs> special occasions, uh, bar mitzvahs, and whatever. So, so we, we opened this place, and, um, and this is a vat that we fill with treasures the students uh, dig in. This is a replacement eyes, in case uh, you lose one. Um, these are some uh, signs that we have all over the place, <laughs> practical joking with pirates. Uh, while you're reading this sign, we pull a rope in the, behind the counter, and eight mop heads uh, drop on your head. Um, that was just my one thing. I said, we have to have something that drops on people's heads. So <laughs> it became mop heads. And um, so this is the fish theater, which is just a saltwater tank with three seats. <laughs> so, uh, and then right behind it, we set up this, uh, this space, uh, which was the tutoring center. So right there is the tutoring center. And then behind the curtain was the McSweeney's offices, where all of us would be working on the magazine and book editing and things like that. So the kids would come in, or we thought that they would come in. Uh, I should back up because we, uh, we, we set the place up, we opened up, we uh, spent months and months renovating this place. It was, uh, uh, we had tables, chairs, computers, everything. I went to a dot-com auction at a Holiday Inn in uh, Palo Alto, and I bought uh, 11 G4s with a stroke of a paddle. And um, uh, anyway, uh, and, uh, and we, we brought them, we set everything up, and, uh, and then we waited. Uh, it was started with about 12 of my friends, uh, people I had known for years that were writers in the, in the neighborhood. And we sat, and we just at 2.30, we put a sandwich board out in this front sidewalk, and it just said free tutoring for all your English-related and writing-related needs. Just come in. It's all free. And uh, so we thought, oh, they're going to storm the gates. They're going to they're gonna love it. And, um, and uh, they didn't. And so <laughs> we waited, and we sat at the tables. We waited, we waited. Everybody was coming, becoming very discouraged because it was weeks and weeks that we waited, really, where nobody came in. And, um, and then somebody alerted us to the fact that maybe there was a, a trust gap uh, because uh, <laughs> we were, we were uh, operating uh, you know, behind a pirate supply store. So, uh, so we never put it together, you know? And, and so, uh, so then uh, around that time, we, um, uh, I, I persuaded uh, a woman named Nineveh Caligari, a longtime San Francisco educator. She was teaching in Mexico City. Um, she had all the experience necessary, knew everything about education, all, was connected with all the teachers and community members in the neighborhood. I convinced her to move up from Mexico City where she was teaching. She took over as executive director immediately. She made the inroads with the teachers and the parents and the students and everything. And so suddenly it was actually full every day. And what we were trying to offer was every day was one-on-one -on -one attention. Uh, the goal is to have a one-to-one -one ratio with every one of these students. And so, you know, it's been proven that 35 to 40 hours a year with one-on-one -on -one attention, a student can get one grade level higher. And so, um, <clears throat> so most of these students, English is not spoken in the home. They come there many times, their parents, you can't see it, but there's a church pew that I bought in a Berkeley auction. It's right there, and the parents will sometimes watch while their kids are being tutored. And so that was the basis of it, was one-on-one -on -one attention. And uh, you know, we found ourselves full every day with kids, if you're on Valencia Street, within those few blocks, uh, at around 2, 2.30, you will get run over often by the kids in their big backpacks or whatever, like actually running to this space, which is very strange um, because it's school in a way. But, um, 
but, but there was something psychological happening there that was just a little bit different. And the other thing was there was no stigma. The kids weren't going into the center for kids that need more help or something like that. <laughs> it was 826 Valencia. First of all, it was a pirate supply store, which is insane. And then secondly, um, <laughs> There's a publishing company in the back, right? And so our interns were actually working at the same tables very often and shoulder to shoulder, computer next to computer with the students. And so it became a tutoring center, a publishing center is what we called it, and a writing center. And so they go in and they might be working with a high school student actually working on a novel because we had very gifted kids too. And so there's no stigma, they're all working next to each other. It's all a creative endeavor. They're seeing adults, they're modeling the behavior of these adults that are working in the field. They can lean over, ask a question of one of these adults, and, uh, and, and it all sort of uh, uh, you know, feeds on each other. There's a lot of cross-pollination. And the only problem, especially for the adults uh, working at McSweeney's who hadn't necessarily bought into all of this when they signed up, uh, was that there was just the one bathroom. <laughs> um, with like, you know, 60 kids a day, this is a problem. But, you know, there's something about the kids finishing their homework in a given day, working one-on-one, -on -one, getting all this attention, they finish their homework, they go home, they're finished. They don't stall, they don't do their homework in front of the TV, they're allowed to go home, 5.30, enjoy their family, enjoy other uh, hobbies, get outside, play, and that makes a happy family. A bunch of happy families in a neighborhood is a happy community. A bunch of happy communities tied together is a happy city and a happy world, right? So the key to it all is homework, right? Um, <laughs> there you have it. Um, you know, this one-on-one uh, -on -one attention. So, so we started off with about 12 volunteers, and then we had about uh, 50, and then a couple hundred, and we now have 1,400 volunteers on our, on our roster. And uh, all of them, we make it incredibly easy to volunteer. The only key thing is, even if you have a couple hours a month, those two hours, shoulder to shoulder, next to one student, concentrated attention, shining this beam of light on their work, on their, on, on, on their thoughts and, and uh, their uh, self-expression, is going to be absolutely transformative because so many of the students have not had that ever before. So we said, even if you can have two hours, one Sunday, every six months, it doesn't matter. That's going to be enough. So that's partly why the tutor core grew so fast. So then we said, well, what are we going to do with the space during the day? because it has to be used before 2.30. So we started bringing in classes during the day. So every day there's a field trip where they together create a book. You can see it being typed uh, up above. This is one of the classes getting way too excited about uh, writing. And um, you just point a camera at a class, and it always looks like this. So <laughs> this is one of the books that they uh, do. Notice the uh, title of the book that they, the book that was never checked out, Titanic. And uh, the first line of that book is, uh, um, once there was a book uh, named Cindy uh, that was about the Titanic. Um, so, <laughs> meanwhile, there's an adult in the back typing this up, you know, and taking it completely seriously, which is, you know, blows their mind. So, so then uh, we still had more tutors to use. This is a, a shot of just some of the tutors during our, uh, one of the events. So then we said, the teachers that we work with, and everything is different to teachers, they tell us what to do. We went in there thinking, we're ultimately completely malleable. You're going to tell us, the neighborhood's going to tell us, the parents are going to tell us, the teachers will tell us how we're most useful. So then we said, well, why don't you come into the schools? Because what about the students that wouldn't come to you necessarily, who don't have really active parents that are bringing them in? Or, or aren't close enough. So then we started saying, well, well we've got 1,400 people on our tutor roster. Let's just put out the word. Teacher will say, I need, I need 12 tutors for the next five Sundays. We're working on our college essays. And uh, send them in. So we put that out on the wire. 1,400 tutors, whoever can make it, signs up. They go in about a half an hour before the class. The teacher tells them what to do, how to do it, what their training is, what their project is so far. They work under the, the, the teacher's guidance all in one big room. And that's actually the brunt of what we do, is just people going straight from their workplace, straight from home, straight into the classroom and working directly with the students. So then we're able to work with uh, thousands and thousands of more students. Then another school said, well, what if, what if we just give you a classroom and you can staff it all day? So this is the Everett Middle School uh, writer's room where we decorated it in Buccaneer style. It's right off the library. And then we serve uh, all 529 kids in this middle school. And this is their newspaper, the Straight Up News. It has an ongoing column uh, from Mayor uh, Gavin Newsom in uh, both languages, uh, English and Spanish. Um, so then, uh, you know, one day, uh, Isabel Allende wrote to us and said, hey, why don't you assign a book with uh, high school students? I want them to write about how to, how to achieve peace in a violent world. And so we went into Thurgood Marshall High School, which is a school that we had worked with uh, on some other things. 
And, um, and we gave that assignment to the students. We said, Isabel Allende is going to read all your essays at the end. She's going to publish them in books. She's going to sponsor the printing of this book in paperback form. It's going to be available uh, in all the bookstores in the Bay Area and throughout the world on Amazon and you name it. So these kids worked harder than they've ever, ever worked on anything in their lives because there was that outside audience. There was uh, Isabel Allende on the other end. There were, I think we had about 170 tutors that worked on this book with them. Um, and so this worked out incredibly well. We had a big party at the end. This is a book that you can find anywhere. So that led to a series of these. You can see Amy Tan sponsored uh, the next one. I might get somewhere. And this became an ongoing thing, more and more books. Now, uh, and we're sort of addicted to the book thing. The kids will work harder than they've ever worked in their life if they know it's going to be permanent, not, know it's going to be on a shelf, know that nobody can diminish what they've, what they've thought and said, that, it's, uh, that they, we've honored their words, honored their thoughts with the hundreds of hours of you know, five drafts, six drafts, all this attention that we give to their thoughts. And uh, once they achieve that level, once they've written at that level, they can never go back. It's absolutely transformative. So then they're all sold in the store. This is uh, near the planks. And so we sell all the student books. And where else would you put them, right? And so, um, so we sell them. And then something weird had been happening with the uh, stores. The store actually, even though we started out as just a gag, the store actually um, made money. So uh, it, it was paying the rent. Um, and maybe this is just a San Francisco thing. I don't know. I don't want to judge. And so, but people would come in. Um, this was before all the pirate movies and everything. It was making a lot of money, not a lot of money, but it was paying the rent, paying a full-time staff member. There's the ocean maps you can see on the left. Um, and uh, and it, was, it became a gateway to the community. People would come in and say, what the, uh, and then, what is this? I don't want to swear in the, on the web. And, um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, I don't know, is that a rule? I don't know. So they would say, what is this? And, and people would uh, come in. And, uh, and learn more about it. And then right beyond, there's usually a little chain there. Right beyond, they would see the kids being tutored. This is a field trip going on. And so they would be shopping. And they might be more likely to buy some lard or millet for their parrot or, uh, or uh, you know, a hook or hook protector for nighttime. All of these things we sell. So the store actually did really well. But it brought in so many people, teachers, donors, volunteers, everybody, because it was street level. It was open to the public. It wasn't a nonprofit buried you know, on the 30th floor of some building in downtown. It was right in the neighborhood that it was serving, and it was open all the time to the public. So it became this sort of like weird, happy accident. So all the people I used to know in Brooklyn, they said, well, why don't we have a place like that here? And a lot of them had been you know, former educators or would-be educators. So they combined with a lot of local designers, local writers, and they just took the idea independently, and they did their own thing. They didn't want to sell pirate supplies. Uh, they didn't think that that was going to work there. So uh, knowing uh, the uh, crime-fighting community in New York, they opened the Brooklyn Superhero <laughs> Supply Company. So this is Sam Potts, this great designer that did this. And this was to make it look like sort of like one of those Keysmith shops that has to have every service they've ever offered, you know, all over there. So they opened this place. Inside, it's like a Costco for, for superheroes. So, <laughs> All the supplies in kind of basic form, they're all, these are all handmade. These are all sort of repurposed other products or whatever. All the packaging is done by Sam Potts. So then you have the villain containment unit where kids put their parents. <laughs> you have the office. This is a, uh, a little uh, the vault. You have to put your product in there. It goes up an electric lift. And then the guy behind the counter tells you that you have to recite the vow of heroism, which you do if you want to buy anything. Um, and uh, it limits, really, their sales, personally, I think. It's a problem. <laughs> Um, because they have to do it, and you know, hand on heart and everything. So, and this is some of the products. Um, these are all handmade. This is a secret identity kit if you want to take on the identity of Sharon Boone, one American female marketing uh, executive from Hoboken, New Jersey. It's a full dossier on everything you would need to know about Sharon Boone. So, this is the capery, where uh, you get fitted for your cape, and then you walk up these three steel graded steps, and then we turn on three hydraulic fans. Uh, from every side, and then you can see the, the cape in action. There's nothing worse than, you know, getting up there and uh, the cape is bunching up or something like that. So, uh, so then, the secret door, this is uh, one of the shelves. You don't see it when you walk in, but it slowly opens. You can see it there in the middle next to all the grappling hooks. It opens, and then this is the tutoring center in the back. So you can see the... Uh... Oh, thanks. 
But you know, this is, I just want to emphasize, locally funded, locally built, all the designers, all the builders, everybody was local, all the time was pro bono. I just came and visited and said, yes, you guys are doing great, or whatever, that was it. You can see the time in all five boroughs of New York in the back. <laughs> um, so, so this is the space uh, during tutoring hours, it's very busy. Same principles, one-on-one -on -one attention, complete devotion to the students' work, and a boundless sort of optimism and sort of the possibility of creativity and ideas. And it's all sort of, you know, the switch is flicked in their heads when they walk through those 18 feet of this bizarre store, right? So it's school, but it's not school. It's clearly not school, even though they're working shoulder to shoulder on tables, pencils and papers, whatever. And this is one of the students, Khaled Hamdan. Uh, you can read this quote, addicted to video games and TV, couldn't concentrate at home, came in, he got this concentrated attention, and uh, he couldn't uh, escape it. So, soon enough, uh, he was writing, he would finish his homework early, got really addicted to finishing his homework early. It's a very, it's an addictive thing to sort of be done with it, and to have it checked, and to know he's going to achieve the next day, and be prepared for the school the next day. So he got hooked on that, and then he started doing other things. He's now been published in five books. He co-wrote a mockumentary about uh, failed superheroes called Super Hasbins. Um, <laughs> He wrote a series uh, 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 on Penguin Balboa, which is a fighting, uh, uh, you know, a boxing penguin. And, uh, and then he read aloud uh, just a few weeks ago to 500 people at Symphony Space at a benefit for 826 New York. So he's there every day. He's evangelical about it. He brings his cousins in. Now there's four family members that come in every day. So uh, I'll go through really quickly. This is LA, uh, the Echo Park Time Travel Mart. Whenever you are, we're already then. Um, <laughs> This is a, sort of a 7-Eleven for time travelers. So you see everything, it's exactly as a 7-Eleven would be. <laughs> Leeches, mammoth chunks, they even have their own Slurpee machine. Out of order, come back yesterday. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so uh, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, these are spaces that are only affiliated with us, doing the same thing. Word Street in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Ink Spot in Cincinnati. You Speak, San Francisco, California, which inspired us. Studio St. Louis in St. Louis. Austin Batcave in Austin. Fighting Words in Dublin, Ireland, started by Roddy Doyle. This will be open in April. I'm gonna, uh, now I'm going into the uh, Ted Wish. Whew, is that okay? <laughs> All right, I got a minute. Um, so the Ted Wish, I wish that you, you personally and every creative individual and organization that you know will find a way to directly engage with the public school in your area and that you will then tell the story of how you got involved so that within a year we have a thousand examples, a thousand <laughs> examples of transformative partnerships, profound leaps forward. And these can be things that maybe you're already doing. I know that so many people in this room are already doing really interesting things. I know that for a fact. So tell us these stories and inspire others on the, on the uh, website. So we uh, created a website. I'm going to switch to we and not I hope. We hope that the attendees of this conference will usher in a new era of participation in our public schools. We hope that you will take the lead in partnering your innovative spirit and expertise with that of innovative educators in your community. Always let the teachers lead the way. They will tell you how to be useful. I hope that you'll step in and be and, 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 uh, and help out. There's a million ways you can walk up to your local school and consult with the teachers. They'll always tell you how to help. So, this is with the hot studio in San Francisco. They did this phenomenal job. This website is already up. It's already got a, a bunch of stories, a lot of ideas. It's called Once Upon a School, which is a great title, I think. This site will document every story, every project that comes out of this conference and around the world. So you go to the website, you see a bunch of ideas you can be inspired by, and then you add your own projects once you get started. Um, so uh, hot studio did a great job and a very tight deadline. So visit the site. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask this guy, who's our director of national programs. He'll be on the phone. In, you email him, he'll answer any question you possibly want, and uh, he'll get you inspired and get you going and guide you through the process so that you can uh, affect change. And it can be fun. That's the point of this talk, is that it, it needn't be uh, sterile. It needn't be uh, bureaucratically um, untenable. Um, you, can, uh, you, you can do and use the skills that you, that you have. The schools need you, the teachers need you, students and parents need you, they need your actual person, your physical personhood and your open minds and open ears and boundless compassion, sitting next to them, listening and nodding and asking questions for hours at a time. Some of these kids just don't plain know how good they are, how smart and how much they have to say. You can tell them. You can shine that light on them one human interaction at a time. So we hope you'll join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Ja, merci. 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 Merci.